Well, it's good to see you at the, nine, the 1045 service. I don't know whether I should commend you for being wise and in forward thinking and coming to the second service on Daylight Savings or whether I should encourage you all to get uh, smart devices that, that set, their own, set themselves forward. I'll let you guys decide which category that is. Well, as the slide says, my name is John Beckel. I'm the executive pastor here. Um, I'm relatively new. I've been here since August. You may wonder, what does an executive pastor do? Well, I have the privilege of, of working with and strategizing with uh, all the ministry uh, directors, all, all the different departments, and supporting them in, in serving you so that you can serve the world. Um, as a father of, of four daughters and a husband of a wife, uh, I just want to say thank you to you as, as a community for welcoming uh, us so well. You have neighbored us well, and we are very grateful uh, that we are part of this family. But I have a bone to pick. Um, not with you, not with you. I have a bone to pick with Leonard Nimoy. Now, I know I may be dating myself, but, but uh, how many people here know who Leonard Nimoy is? He's the OG of the year. Oh, wow, most people, the original Spock. I'm sure he was a, a fine gentleman, seemed very logical. Um, but Leonard Nimoy cost me dozens, if not hundreds of hours of sleep as a young boy. You see, Leonard Nimoy hosted a show called In Search Of. Has anybody here heard of that show? Well, here's the deal. As a young boy growing up in Southern California, I saw the show on Bigfoot that Leonard Nimoy hosted. And Leonard Nimoy let me as a young boy know that, that Bigfoot lived in the Sierra Nevadas in California. So as a young boy, I realized that every night, Bigfoot would make his way down from the Sierra Nevadas, cross the entire San Joaquin Valley, get down the five freeway, get off the La Paz exit, and he was looking in my window through the banana leaves every single night. So began my trail of terror. Bigfoot was there looking at me, so I grabbed my pillow and I would grab my blanket and I would make my way to my parents' bedroom. The problem was, for some reason, in my world, Bigfoot was able to teleport through walls. So now Bigfoot was in the home. Every shadow on the way to my parents' was Bigfoot. And I would be frozen in, in sheer terror for what seemed like hours until I got to my parents' bedroom. And the funny thing was I would get to my parents' bedroom and I would collapse at the, um, at the side of the bed where my father slept and I would fall asleep. I would fall asleep instantly because being with my father made all the difference. Being with my father made Bigfoot disappear. Being with my father was my safe place. And we're going to see a very similar message in Psalm 91. Now, we may not know the author of this psalm, and we may not know the exact occasion of its writing, but, but we know that this psalm has been loved by believers for over 3,000 years. In fact, Martin Luther calls this the sparkling jewel of the whole Psalter. And it's because of this, it's because of the message of this psalm. And the message is simple. God protects those who are with him. God protects those who are with him. It's laid out in three distinct movements. First, we're going to get a picture of our protecting God in verses 1 and 2. And then 3 through 13, we're going to see this, this amazing description of how exactly God protects us. And then to top it off, we're going to see a promise from our God of his commitment to protect us. And after we finish exploring this, we're, we're going to do a couple things. We, we need to ask some big questions. We need to ask some big questions of ourselves, of our God, and of this text. So we, we have a lot to do this morning, and, uh, and I need help, so let, let us, let's pray right now. Father God, we, we need you. I need you. Um, we so often get caught up in our own lives and in, in our own noise. Father, clear the noise right now. We need to be doers of your word and not, not hearers only. So I pray right now that the, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be pleasing to you, our, O oh God, our rock, our redeemer, our fortress, and our friend. Amen. So if you have your Bibles or your, or your smart devices, please turn to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. We're going to be having our nose in the text here for the first few minutes. So I just I want you to bear with me. We're going to be really running through this, but we need to make sure we understand what this the, the, the psalm is saying uh, for us to move forward. So let's jump in at verse 1, verse 1 and 2. 
He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. In just two verses, in just 35 words, we have this amazing, complex picture of our protecting God. We have four words, four names of God, and we have four images that unpack this protecting metaphor. Look at the names. He is the Most High. No one is above him. No one is stronger. No one can protect better. He is positioned above all things. He's the most, most high creator of the universe. And you know what? He is our shelter. He has provided us a home, a place to stay, a place to be safe. And it cuts every threat down to size, doesn't it? He's also the, um, the almighty, the El Shaddai. He is all powerful. He can do anything and he can do everything. But this is also the covenant-keeping, faithful God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, who has power over all things. And this faithful God walks so, so, clo so closely with us that we can live in his shadow. And here in Chicagoland, being in the shadows is pleasant, right? But to somebody reading this, somebody reading this when it was written, you have to understand that, that being in a shadow is about life or death. When you're in your desert, being in a shadow is life-saving. The all-powerful one provides life, and he is faithful, he is intimate, he is present. But we also see the Lord, the Yahweh, the great I Am, the one who is with you. He is our refuge and our fortress. He's able to protect us from the very worst of our fears. His presence guarantees to protect us in the face of all dangers, and he is always near. And then we see that my God is the one in whom I trust. My God, the, the, one, the one who chose me, the one that I choose, the one in whom I trust, my ultimate security is in my relationship with him over all things. My God, who is above all things, the most powerful one, the faithful keeper of his word, he is with you and you are his. This is the God that welcomes us, that gives us a home, that covers us, that sustains our life and protects us. This is the Father God of Psalm 91. This is our God. Now look exactly what God's presence does to protect us. Let's look at verses 3 to 13. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor an arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Now look at how the, look at how the psalmist, using this poetic language, look at how he unpacks God's protecting presence. What will God do for us here? Verse 3, he will deliver you. Verse 4, he will cover you and give you refuge. His faithfulness is a shield for you. Verse 5 and 6, you have no need to fear. Verse 7 to 10, evil will not come near you. Verse 11, he will guard you and carry you. And then verses 12 and 13, you will tread and trample on all danger. That's how God protects. But now look at what he protects us from. Let's go back up to verse 3. He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from deadly pestilence. You see, God protects us from the evil plots and schemes of man. That's the snare of the fowler. But he also protects us in this fallen world that we live in where there's disease and there's death. Verse 4, he covers us like a mother bird. His faithfulness protects us. His faithfulness, not ours. His faithfulness protects us. His character is a shield. And it's also a buckler, which is simply a small shield. You see, God protects us from all danger, both big 
and small. And then verse 5, we have this amazing idea that we need not fear. During the day or, or during the night, we need not fear darkness. We need not fear attacks. We need not to fear disease or disaster. When I was in kindergarten, my dad took a job to open a, uh, a manufacturing plant for Abbott Laboratories in Puerto Rico. So he moved the whole family down there. It was a wonderful time to be a young kid. I spent three years running around the beach in Puerto Rico. It was, it was an awesome time. But one time we were shopping in San Juan, and it's not the touristy part of San Juan. It's the regular San Juan, which is, is just a different deal. And um, long story short, I got separated from my mom and my sisters. Uh, I walked out on the street, and I was lost. And I was in the middle of San Juan, Puerto Rico, and I knew a little bit of Spanish. And I was terrified. And to make things more interesting, I got picked up by the police, but it wasn't just a police car, it was the SWAT team wagon. They picked me up and threw me in the back with all the gear, with all the guns, with all the ammo. So here I am, lost, I can't speak the language, I'm this pudgy little first grade kid, and I'm terrified. I'm terrified. I will never forget the moment when I was able to see my mom through this van on the streets of San Juan, Puerto Rico, and all the fear just went away. I was safe. I was home. I was in the presence of my mom. The fear had been driven out. And that's what God's presence does for us. There's still terrors in the night. There's still arrows by day. There's still disease and destruction. But we don't have to be afraid. We don't need to fear. Verse 7 and 8 continues this, this uh, protecting that God does, explaining it to us. Nothing can touch you, and the wicked will pay. God gets personal here. Everyone's going to fall around you, but I got you. You're going to be okay. Watch what I do to those who oppose and reject me. And even further, 9 and 10, no evil will befall you. No sickness will plague you. Because you are with me and you are mine, you are going to be fine. I remember um, being in a Colombian airport a uh, rural Colombian airport. I was in a rural Colombian airport because my mom was raised in Colombia and we had family down there. And as a small boy, uh, when we were landing, um, there were cows that were in between the uh, runways that were chained up to eat the grass. I quickly realized I was not, um, I was not in, in a, a regular airport. This is a little bit different. Um, and I got off and all the sights and the sounds and the smells, everything was different. And it was a scary place for a little kid. So I developed a strategy to get through, we had to go through a couple of different airports. I developed a strategy. I was right, stand right behind my dad, and I would look at his back, and I would follow him. And I knew that if I was with him, I was going to be okay. And again, this is what the psalmist wants us to get. Nothing bad will happen to you if you are with your father. He will guard you in all your ways and carry you. In fact, you won't even stub your toe, the text says. More than that, he's going to help you trample everything, all dangers. God will protect you in miraculous ways. So you look back to verse 4, there's this image of the pinion of the wings. Well, this is, this is similar here in verse 11. They both paint a picture of divine protection, don't they? In the middle of the storms of life, we have the wings and feathers of the mother bird covering and deflecting, and now we have the wings of angels guarding and protecting. And this protection spans from a little minor foot injury to the scariest animals of the time, the lion, and actually adders should be cobra here. God will protect you from them. In fact, he will only protect you from them, but you're going to trample them. So in short, this is a really poetic way. This is a really poetic way for God to say this simply. God is saying in this psalm that the Father in his presence will protect you in every way all the time. God will protect you in every way all the time. And to make sure that the reader really gets it, the, the psalm now shifts to speaking uh, to God speaking, and he is going to promise protection over his people. Look at verses 14 to 16. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, and I will rescue him and honor him. And with long life, I will satisfy him and show him his, my salvation. Because he holds fast to me in love, because he knows my name, 
Listen to the promises of God. I will deliver. I will protect. I will answer when you call. I will be with you in trouble. I will rescue. I will honor. I will satisfy and sustain. I will save. That's a promise from God to those who dwell with him. Now this psalm is in line with the testimony of the Old Testament. God is a warrior king and a father who fights for his people, those who love him, who are with him. He will give complete security and victory to those who dwell with him and trust him. This psalm would have been great comfort to the Jewish people. As they looked back and they saw God's protection um, since Moses. God is faithful. He's all-powerful. He's present. And he protects his own. God's presence protects his own. God's presence protects completely. And God's presence, uh, protection is promised. Our all-powerful, all ever-faithful God promises to protect his own in every way, all the time. Amen. Let's go home. It's a nice place to stop. This is God's word. This is all true, and it feels good. And I, it feels good to me. It makes me happy. I hope it makes you happy. But I think it would be wrong and, and a disservice to the text and a disservice to you if I stopped here. Just look out the windows. Look at your own life. We know that pain and suffering exist. And most of, most of us, if not all of us, we know people who love Jesus, who have experienced deep tragedy. Is this psalm really guaranteeing that, that if we're with God, we'll never experience any form of pain? How do we reconcile this truth with our experience in the world? We have some, some hard questions to ask of ourselves in this text and God. And this is where I think we need to do a little, uh, uh, have a little spiritual optometry. I'm relatively new to the uh, eyeglass world. I got glasses when I was 45. I won't tell you how long ago that was. Uh, but I, I remember going to the optometrist. I'd never been, so I was like a little kid as they kept flipping the different lenses and things kept getting clearer and clearer and clearer. And all of a sudden, my world changed. And I think we need to, to take God's word um, and do some spiritual optometry with Psalm 91. And to understand it rightly, we need to see it clearly through several different lenses. So I'm going to offer us four different lenses that we need to see Psalm 91 through. The first is the lens of our destiny. We need to see Psalm 91 through the lens of our destiny, and our destiny, destiny is very clear. It's Revelation 21, 1 through 4. Listen to what John sees uh, at the end of time. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. You see, when we look at Psalm 91 through the lens of our destiny, it begins to make sense. There will be a day, there will be a point in history where God says, now it's going to be the way it's supposed to be. And we are going to dwell perfectly with God. And because we're dwelling perfectly with God, guess what? We're going to dwell perfectly with each other. There will be no more pain, no more crying, no more mourning. It will be the way it's supposed to be. There will be no stubbed toes. There will be no death by pestilence. When we see God's perfect protection through the lens of our destiny as God's people, hear this. We understand that Psalm 91 is not a simple promise for immediate prevention of suffering, but is a promise for the ultimate removal of all despair. Let me say that again. When we understand that Psalm 91 is not a simple promise for immediate prevention of suffering, 
but we understand it to be the ultimate removal of all despair. We are looking through this lens of our destiny. One day, it will be the way it is supposed to be. Amen. That's wonderful, and that is true, and that is good, and I hope you can hang on to that. That's the passage that I memorized in seminary and I hold on to all the time. One day it's going to be the way it's supposed to be. But it's not now, is it? It's not now. So we need to also look at Psalm 91 through the lens of our time. And this can be a time that is confusing because it's a time that is already, but not yet. It's becoming the way it's supposed to be. God's plan to make it the way it's supposed to be has been inaugurated. It's been started, but it's not yet completed. It's not finalized. So we are protected by God. Yes, this is true, but we are also afflicted in a fallen world. Both are true, and this can be confusing. Listen to how Jesus himself describes our confusing times. In John 16, he says this to his disciples. I have said these things to you that you may have peace. Okay, I want you to have peace, so here's what I'm going to tell you. In the world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Or even more perplexing, in Luke 21, 16, Jesus is talking uh, to his disciples, and he's prophetically talking about what's going to happen in the future. And he says, you will be delivered up, even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you, some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. First of all, I had to figure out what that meant for me personally. (laughs) But have peace because you're going to have trouble because I am with you. You might, some of you might even die. You're going to experience trouble, but not a hair of your head is going to be touched. We live in the already, but not yet. Jesus says you will have trouble. You may even be killed, but you don't need to fear. Not even a hair of your head will perish. We can take heart and endure because he has overcome the world. In fact, our endurance helps us gain our lives. So when we see God's perfect protection in Psalm 91 through the lens of our time, we see that Psalm 91 is not a promise to keep us from suffering, but a promise to keep us through suffering. Let me say that again. When we see God's perfect protection in Psalm 91 through the lens of our time, we see that it is not a promise to keep us from suffering, but a promise to keep us through suffering. In fact, this is exactly what Psalm 91 says. Look at verse 15 if you have your Bibles open. God is talking here. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. God is present with us in trouble. Psalm 91 is a promise to keep us through suffering. Folks, the enemy wants so badly for us to misinterpret and misunderstand this psalm. He wants us to believe that the purpose of life is the pursuit of comfort and the avoidance of pain. He wants us to focus on seeking our own preservation, not seeking the protecting presence of God. Do you know who quotes Psalm 91 in the New Testament? Satan. Satan himself quotes it. And basically he says this. He says, Jesus, if you trust that God will protect you, doesn't the psalm say that that he will not even allow you to stub your toe? So surely you can throw yourself off this cliff. And if God doesn't do that, he's not keeping his word. Satan knows that if we take this psalm at this face value reading, we're going to be confused. And that confusion will lead to disappointment. And he wants that disappointment to lead to us walking away from God. This, the message that he wants us to so clearly understand is this. He, Satan wants us to, to believe that if you trust God, nothing bad will happen. That's what he wants you to believe. Nothing bad will happen. Your life will go smoothly. And if you love God and his angels, uh, they will so closely guard you that you're not even going to stub your toe. That is not the message of Psalm 91. God does not promise to keep us from suffering. He promises to keep us through suffering. This is such an important message for our time, isn't it? 
Our culture is so caught up in the belief that life is about pleasure and the avoidance of pain. And if you can't avoid pain, you're going to create your own fortresses, aren't you? You're going to find your own fortress of wealth or control or competence, your own physical looks, you know, for students, your academic ability, your athletic skill, or even the amount of likes you have on social media. We create counterfeit fortresses that we want to use to protect ourselves. Satan wants us to believe that nothing bad will happen if something bad happens, we're going to go to ourselves for protection. Psalm 91 is giving us a totally different message. We need to seek God through our suffering. And speaking of enduring suffer, suffering, we need to see Psalm 91 through the one called the suffering servant. We need to see Psalm 91 through the lens of Jesus himself. If you look back at verse 4, we see this language of God protecting his, his people, those who are with him, by saying, He will cover you with his pinions, which are simply wings, and under his wings you will find refuge. You know, Jesus says something very similar when he's weeping over Jerusalem because they have not heard his message. In Luke 13, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. The heart of Jesus and the work of Jesus was to gather and protect us under his wings, just like the promise of Psalm 91. And don't miss the beautiful, painful image here. The mother bird covers and protects, but the mother bird also suffers from the elements, from the rain, from the snow, from the heat. The mother bird faces the dangers of predators. The mother bird bears the pain so that under her wings her, her children might live. And this analogy shows us just how committed Jesus is to protecting us. On the cross, what did he do? He literally covered us and shielded us from all harm, from the fall, from our sin. He bore all the wrath and all the pain that we deserve so that we could have a way back to the Father, so that we could dwell with the Father and he could be our fortress. And we would have a place to dwell. Through the suffering of Jesus, we can now call on him and we can dwell with the Father. We have full access to the Father through Jesus. And when I understand this, when I understand that my life is hidden in Christ, I can make sense of suffering when it comes my way. In fact, God uses suffering for our good. In one of the most quoted passages of the New Testament, Paul says this in Romans 8, 28. 8, 28 for we know that all those who love God, for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So this verse is for those who love God. That's only possible through the finished work and covering work of Jesus, that all things are possible. We get this mixed up. It's not that all things are good but that he uses all things, both the good and the bad, for our own good. And it's for those who are called, again, for those who have been brought into the presence of the Father through Jesus. In his death and resurrection, Jesus is saying, I'll hide you in me so nothing really threatens you. Both good and bad are working together for your good. My sister Catherine is, is living this reality right now. Um, I was born in 1969, Four days after my birth, I was adopted uh, by my parents. They couldn't have children, so four months later, they were pregnant. And Helen Joy came along, and then four years later, another miracle, Catherine Hope came. Um, this, is, um, this is my sister Catherine and her husband Scott, and they are four adopted daughters, adopted just like me. Uh, in 2016, Catherine found out that she had stage four uh, appendix cancer. And, you know, cancer is everywhere. She has undergone over 36 rounds of chemo and experimental trials. When I was writing this, 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 uh, this message on, on Wednesday, I had to text her because how can I talk about uh, God's all-protecting, um, all-caring power in our lives and, and not get her, her view. And I, I, I texted her and I said, 
I said, how, how do you process this? What do you do with this? Because Catherine is somebody who is really dwelling, dwelling under the wings of God. And this is what my, little, my baby sister sent me. She said, I love Psalm 91, and it provides much comfort to me. Listen to this. To be able to rush under the protection of the Almighty and be assured of his deliverance in the midst of much, su- in the midst of much suffering is a daily luxury. I crawl into his courage, and I move forward without fear of the future. I know ultimately I get to be with my king forever. And as far as long life, Psalm 138, 8 says, The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. And then she says, I am confident I will go home when my purpose is done. Catherine is living and dwelling this reality right now. She's a living picture of someone who's living under the cover of Jesus. She is dwelling with God. You see, Catherine understands that God uses suffering to bring us back to him, the suffering of his son to bring us back to him so that we would ultimately be free from suffering and currently be able to walk through suffering with our father. And Catherine also understands that God uses suffering to keep us coming back to him and to help us become more like him, and to help us root out and destroy all the counterfeit fortresses. When we were hidden under the wings of God because of the work of Jesus, we can have hope for a despair-free future, and we can have courage for a fear-free today. That is the road that Catherine Hope and all of us who are under the wings of God through the gift of Jesus are walking right now. We need to see Psalm 91 through the lens of Jesus. He has given us access to to dwell with our Father, which leads to one final lens. We need to look through the lens of Psalm 91 itself. Because Psalm 91 is not a call, it's not a, a, a call for a carefree life free of worry and suffering. There's a specific call for us here. Our call is not to question God's protection. Protection is God's work. So what's our work when we look at Psalm 91? Well, when I look at Psalm 91, I see that our work is to dwell in the shelter of the Most High, to trust God, to not fear, to make the Lord my dwelling place, to hold fast to God in love, and to call on him in trouble. That's my call, that's your call from Psalm 91. See, today our temptation is to fret and to worry about how God's going to protect us. That's his work. Our temptation maybe is to try and protect ourselves. That's not our job. He's got it. Or maybe we're tempted to run to counterfeit fortresses. There's only one fortress that will provide and protect forever. According to Psalm 91, our goal is the presence of the Father not preserving our lives. Our goal is the presence of the Father, not preserving our lives. So our call is to not fret or fear, but to rest, to trust, to believe in, and to love God our Father. That's the only place that offers perfect protection, the presence of the Father through Jesus. Our job is to accept this finished work of of Jesus, to rest in the protection that he provides. Our job is to love the Father and to dwell in his presence. Our job is to seek refuge in God above all else, to have no counterfeit fortresses. And our job is not to provide ultimate protection. Our job is to seek, to love, and to dwell. Our job is to run to the Father. That is our job. And I'll close with the words from Jesus again, from Luke 13, when he's lamenting over Jerusalem. Remember, he said, How many times did I want to gather you to cover you, to protect you, but you would not. Brothers and sisters, you you have to choose protection. You have to choose that. It's here for you. 
Will you choose it? Will you run to the Father? And if you have chosen to dwell in God's presence, will you rest in it? Will you rest in the Father? So come, let us praise Jesus together, the only one who enables us to run to and find rest with our Father. Amen. Pray with me. Father God, you are good. And in your presence there is rejoicing evermore, there is life, and there is protection. Father, help us to, to run to you above all, all other things. And may you get the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.